33 years before, a sword shall pierce thine own heart also. Despite the pathos of this, there's another pathos in this verse, and it says this, that this man, this child, shall be for the falling of some and the rising of some. Another place, it speaks about him as a stone, that if you fall on the stone in a sp broken spirit, that that'll be good for you. But if you wait till the stone falls upon you, it will crush you. Jesus both is for the rising of those who believe and for the falling of those who do not believe. Um, and then this little verse at the very end that you read, and a sign that is spoken against. We talked about this in other telecasts, that today, who's, who's fighting the gods of the ancient past? But Jesus is still a controversial subject. Jesus still argued in the, we're cutting this in the suburbs of Detroit. Jesus still argued in the stamping areas of our automobile factories, in the engine assembly rooms, in the mills. He's argued today. He's a live topic. He is, for the rising and falling of many, a sign that shall be spoken against, that the thoughts out of many hearts shall be revealed. And your attitude and mine toward this man, born nearly 2,000 years ago, tells more about us than tells about him. What we think about him can no longer affect him at all. What we think about him can affect us a great deal. It reveals. He becomes the litmus paper. He becomes the test of every man. That the thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. I'm not here to preach to you, but I could. And I would ask you, what do you think of this baby? that was in the arms of Simeon, blessed, and handed back to his mother. All right, we have another remarkable thing happened here. I guess this is Old People's Day in the temple. And uh, uh, we have a prophetess. Tell us about her, verse 36 through verse 38. There's a prophetess, Anna, of the, da the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and as a widow till she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting with prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke of him to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now here's uh, an interesting person. She, uh, how old she was, we don't know. Despite the figures given here, if you happen to have uh, one of these uh, parallel Bibles that put four translations in uh, in side by side or six translations or if you have the 26 parallel versions that's been published and check these you will find that this is another one of the verses that's extremely hard to translate uh, it's possible to make her much older than this this one is the most conservative estimate it says she's a widow until she was 84 this is the revised standard version uh, another one says that she was married lived with her husband seven years that's supposing she's married at 15 as girls often were then that would make her 22, and then she'd been a widow for 84 years, which would make her 106. This is the lowest possible age she could be. She might be as young as 84, or she could have been a widow for 84 years. This is not quite clear. Another item, her name is Anna. Now, this is in Greek, and there is no letter H in Greek. There's a little sign, uh, an apostrophe in, above the line, which will, if it, the point of the apostrophe is toward the letter, like this, then you pronounce an H. That's just, you aspirate, you breathe out. Or if there is no, if it is a smooth comma like this, we have um, uh, a no H. So the Greek cannot write Hannah. They can write a, a rough breathing before the Anna and they get a Hannah pronounced. So this woman here, it's of some interest, has the same name as Hannah of the Old Testament. When this arrives in Greek, the H is dropped, 
when we transliterate it over into English, the H is not put back on again. But her name is Hannah. Her name is Hannah. Um, you'll notice that her father's name is given, and the tribal records are still intact. It's important until the family line of Jesus can be established. When Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, these records perished, and you could not be sure that a man was of the tribe of Judah today, even if the Messiah were to come. But as yet, the records are intact, and the tribe of Asher, she knows what tribe she belongs to. Uh, Paul later knew that he was the tribe of Benjamin. At this time, we still have the, the family lines available to us. Here's a remarkable thing, and it shows us that never say anything too flatly. Remember now that there was a court of women in this Gentile, in this temple. Uh, out here around this is a little in inadequate diagram here. But there's a court of women out here. It's an interesting thing, you know, in this day of women's liberation, that uh, uh, there was a place the Gentiles could go so far, and then a Jewish woman could go so far, and then a Jew could go so far. It's also interesting that the offering chest was in the women's part. They never took the risk of uh, having the offerings limited only to the men. They made sure that the offering chest was out where the widow could get at it with her might. And uh, so this woman here is, but she's in the temple. A woman is not supposed to be in the temple. But godliness makes exceptions. And here's a woman who, because of her devout life, has been allowed to break all the rules. She doesn't even have to go home. She's been given a room to stay in, in the temple. And she doesn't leave the temple day or night. Spends her time in prayer. Godly, godly woman. Now, she comes up, and she gives thanks to God, and she recognizes in the Spirit this baby in Mary's arms as being the one hoped for for the redemption of Israel. She spoke to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, and when they had performed everything according to the law, they returned, and Luke says, into Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. Now, if you're following here, that's perfectly true, but they didn't go by that route. We said before now and here that they'd come out of Nazareth, crossed the Jordan, come down the east side of the Jordan, crossed the fords opposite Jericho, taking the switchback roads up, around Bethany to Jerusalem and down to Bethlehem. Now, because he is not going to take the trouble to tell her this intervening part of the story, uh, he really says, I'm going to pick up my story again when they're back at Nazareth. But that's not really what occurred. He just omits it. What occurs is that Jesus flees or is taken down into Egypt to escape Herod, and then after a time comes back and goes to Nazareth. Luke is not wrong. He just didn't tell all the story. In order to pick that part of the story up, we're going to have to turn to Matthew 2. And uh, I think if that's uh, just under this for a moment, let's get the number in here in case someone is following in their um, harmony. This will be section 12, if you happen to have one of the harmonies that we're using. This is section 12 in chapter 2 of, of Matthew. This is going to show a little figure here, if you can only see it or not, but that's the three wise men, supposedly, going from the east to Jerusalem. But read for us, if you will, here now, the opening verses of Matthew 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, O thou Beth Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from thee shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. All right, thank you. Uh, here we have the familiar story of the wise men. They are astrologers. We have a beautiful example here of the condescension of God. 